So, next talk. Um, we have here uh, Fight and Christian. Um, there. <laughs> okay. Uh, automate yourself is in six months. Um, Fight is, uh, in a way, a genius, I would say. Um, it's also. Um, uh, very, very good in, in, in software, in, in a lot of things. Um, worked for a CTO for a company in, in Berlin. And Christian is a consultant for bigger networks and uh, specialized in automation. All right. So uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us. Um, what we'd like to share with you today is basically how everything changed at our ISP, which is Wopcom, within the past month. Um, about a year ago, we decided to rebuild our core network and to do this in a um, very special way because we wanted to do everything automated and uh, we just would wanted to have one user front end for the, the main interactions and everything else should happen. And um, behind that in a defined process. And um, well, who are we? Basically, my job is I'm working as a project manager uh, for internal and customer projects at Wopcom. Um, we are a city carrier from Wolfsburg, uh, which is mostly known for Volkswagen, uh, and uh, we are providing uh, fiber to the home or fiber to the building or fiber to the curb um, for about 30,000 private households in Wolfsburg. And uh, for about three years now, we are uh, doing a full coverage FTTH rollout within Wolfsburg which means we want to connect uh, every single of those uh, 68,000 households in Wolfsburg in the end. And also with us today from Wopcom is uh, Jan and David. Um, Jan is responsible for all this FTTH stuff at Wopcom, so if you are interested in knowing more about that, just reach out to him. He's wearing a uh, blue sweater and uh, yeah, there he is. So, um, if it's not about automation and core network, he's your man. And, um, well, our project involved mostly software, uh, a lot of software, so we had support from one, someone who helped us with that, and this was Fight. Yeah. Um, and I was already introduced, and um, I don't agree with the genius part, but other than that, that was very nice. Um, I work for Port Zero and we develop software for ISPs and IXPs and we do some security work. And generally, as a software engineer in the ISP space, I often find this situation where um, automation means a whole bunch of scripts. And that's, that's fine, you know. Um, it's, that happens because everyone wants to automate their stack and not everyone is a software person. Um, a lot of, lot of people in the uh, network engineering space know how to architect and build networks. They might not know how to architect and build software. Um, and so that's where I came in. And what all I need to be able to work with you is I need a diagram of the process. So um, I just came back in and we draw a diagram of our configuration process. So um, everything starts with planning a change, which is mainly work you do in your brain. And then you have to pour your brain work into a ticket and then can someone can look at it and say it's okay or not. And once we're done with that, um, there's maybe some more organizational work you have to do, communication and so on. And after everything has finished, um, then you can actually do the change. This consists of, uh, well, logging into the switch via SSH or Telnet or whatever your modern hardware is able to do. Uh, and after you're done with configuring, uh, in the best case, you update your ticket. And, um, well, now there are two possible things that can happen. There's the happy path, which is very easy because then you just have to document what you did and update the ticket again and then you're done. Or there's the bad path, uh, which means uh, you realize there's something that broke during the change. And so you have to do a rollback, which is um, more or less easy, depending on the hardware vendor you use. And after you're done with undoing your change, which means always uh, mostly uh, SSH onto your router and so on, you update the ticket again, and then you can start all over. And um, then we took this and put this to fight and said, hey, we want to automate. 
And so this is nicely color coded already, the diagram. So the blue things are what you have to do and the green things are the human machine interactions that I can automate, right? Um, and we can, we can do all of the mechanical stuff, that's not a problem. Um, the blue things, I mean, you still have to plan your change. I, I can't do that for you. Um, but we, we ended up with a process, but then we looked at it and we thought... Well, we looked at the process and uh, there was a quote which came to us, which I want to share with you. Um, Thorsten Dirks, Dirks with, was former CEO of Telefonica, said, if you digitize a shitty process, then you have a shitty digital process. <laughs> well, that's true. Um, I mean, <laughs> if you want to automate, you have to realize that you want to transform. You just don't want to turn an analog process into a digital process one by one. Um, this doesn't make anything better. It just makes things digital, but not easier or quicker or faster. So I want to give you a short example. Um, with a company every one of us knows, actually, it's Netflix. Well, what Netflix uh, did was they're still, they, they started as an online video rental service. So you went to their website, you logged in, and you clicked on the movie you want to watch, but you were not able to watch the movie. Uh, somebody at Netflix had to go to the warehouse, take out the DVD out of the warehouse, put it into an envelope, put a stamp on it, and send it to you with the postal service. And then this arrived a few days later at your home, and then you were able to put it into your DVD player, and you were able to watch the movie after a few days. And uh, after this was done, you had to take it back into the envelope and send it back to Netflix. Well, and then things changed, the internet got... Uh, got some more bandwidth and so on, and uh, things got easier. And now, you as a user go to their website, you click on the movie, and you can instantly enjoy the movie you want to watch. Well, the process still is quite digital, but they removed the analog parts from it, and now they have less work to do to deliver the service to you as a customer, and you as a customer can enjoy your service quicker. And that meant for us, well, we as our own customer wanted to enjoy our services as quick as possible, like it's watching a Netflix movie when I want to configure a VLAN. So with this approach, we uh, went to our process and we asked ourselves, why the hell do we document after we did everything and maybe forgot half of what we did? Um, so the conclusion of this was, the documentation always has to include everything uh, that is necessary to provide a service to us. A service could be something abstract. It could be a VLAN, it could be an IP address on the interface, it could be a routing instance, a BGP session, whatever. Um, we just say everything is kind of a service to us. And um, with this approach of saying, okay, documentation needs to contain every information we need for providing something to ourselves, we got back with fight and designed a new process. Right. And what we decided is documentation has to happen first. And if it does, then it can be a template for our automation. Simple as that. If you tell me what, an IP, what IP address you want on your device and what VLAN you want on your device, I can make that happen, no problem. Um, so all we did with this in mind was we surveyed the existing ecosystem for like open source solutions that maybe you know, are good at documenting stuff or maybe good at rolling out things. And then we picked what we liked and glued it together. And that's all, all we did. And um, you have to keep in mind, this process fundamentally changes the way your company works. This is now the business part, which is for the most of us who are technical involved, not very relevant. But if you go to your manager, management and after that you have to go to your engineers and you have to say, engineers don't provision services anymore, they develop services. It means that the work of your network engineers becomes descriptive and manual parts of the work are gone. And they have to work hand in hand together with developers. And that's not very easy at all for them. So especially in the beginning, it's not very easy for them. And um, after some time, you um, build a process and they use it and then you realize what it means. And we want to just give you a short idea. So we have a quick demo for you. 
Um, it's just a very, very basic example. It's just configuring a VLAN on a switch port, so nothing magical at all. But um, just first, I'd like to, to look on our switch. Um, it's a SN2010 by Mellanox, 2410 by Mellanox and uh, running Cumulus, and I want to configure switch port 48. So just to show you switch port 48, there's nothing on there configured, nothing at all. So now I go into Netbox and I want to configure it. First, I have to start a change. This is the feature we modded, and now I have to describe my change, what I'm going to do. This is relevant for our change management process, which follows idle inside our company. So you have to describe for the change manager, who's nothing technical at all, what you're going to do, so he can see if this is okay, what you said about it, if you can do it during production, or if this maybe breaks something. Um, and um, after you filled out a quick form, and you've chosen a category, so someone can, can see which area this affects, you create a change. Uh, you also can say if it's an emergency, uh, emergency change and so on. And now you go to your network hardware, select the device you want to configure, it's the same stuff Netbox can do. And now I'm going to the switch port, and I will configure just this port as a access port. So I click on edit, and now I say, okay, it belongs to bridge zero, it's uh, access. Um, then I have to click in the old version, update and continue. It's gone already, I select the VLAN. So it's our staging environment. Um, don't wonder about the names, and in this case, I want to have a BPDU card, because it's an edge port for example. Click update, and now you see there's information came in. I have an access port, uh, bridge zero, and now I end my change, and I see what I've changed inside Netbox. I see a summary of what I've written into the ticket, uh, and now I accept the change. What now happens is I'm generating a merge request inside our GitLab containing the information that we just edited inside Netbox. Um, and before we go there, so I just copy the link to go to the um, merge request. Um, before that, I want to show you the switch port, because if you look at the switch port again, you see everything I've changed is gone now, because this is our documentation. And we don't want to document something that we want to change, but that is not part of the reality already. So what now happens is we are going to our merge request, inside GitLab, and what already happened is there was a pipeline running through doing a check run, which basically does some sanity checks and is running Ansible and so on. And uh, you also see there was a ticket created inside our ticket system, and you see there were configuration files generated, and I can do a diff of the actual config that will be applied to the devices. And I see those host variables we are using for exporting the data out of Netbox into the GitLab, which is a YAML file for every device, and I see what I've changed. I've configured an access port and so on. And if I think it's okay, I just have to approve it, and then I can merge it to the network. Uh, we also can define who is allowed to approve. So for example, in production, there's always the ticket system API that has to approve a change if it should be applied to the production system. And after that, um, you have a pipeline starting to run through and to configure the network. Uh, we will later have a deeper look at it, and what it consists of is basically you have a sanity check, um, there are some jobs for ensuring there's, there are not uh, two pipelines running in parallel configuring the network. We also do every check again, because it could be possible that in the meantime something changed in the network, and uh, that would cause interference. So we do again all those check runs, and after that, we are going to do our production run, which actually means that Ansible is going through our network and configuring everything again, if there's something that has changed. And uh, after that is done, and uh, all those jobs run through, uh, there's this last job happening, which is writing back the information we've changed into Netbox. So if we now go into Netbox, then we will see inside Netbox um, that the information is now configured on the port, and uh, you also see now, uh, if my demo would work, or I haven't missed anything, I'm not sure actually. <laughs> um, yeah, sorry. 
for the long gap. Now you see, I just have to refresh, and you see now the information co is inside Netbox, and also if I go on the switch now and just say, okay, show it to me, I see I have configured VLAN 30. So that's everything. And um, there are many parts um, involved in this, and uh, for that I will hand over to Fight, who will give you a short dive into all the tech part. Thanks. All right. So now that we know what it looks like, it might be interesting to know how it does things. Um, as I said before, what we wanted to do is reuse as much as possible and write as little code as possible um, so that we get features for free. Um, so I'm going to go through the components kind of one by one and I'm gonna talk about why we chose what we chose and what we did to make it work. Uh, the first thing is Netbox. Net we use Netbox as our source of truth. Um, as you saw in the demo, we had to change a few things to make it work, though. Um, so currently, the status is that we maintain a fork of Netbox, um, where we have added change management based on ITIL. Um, this needed to be in Netbox because we need we need to have this. Uh, we need to have the ITIL process, and we want to document first, and so this needs to be there. Um, all the Changes that we added, though, are in their own modules. You can swap it out with, like, regular Netbox. The uh, databases don't really interfere with each other. It's totally fine. Um, it made a few things more complex doing it this way. Um, there are some things like the YAML exporter that's all in one module. Um, but it's what it gives us back is that we can we are upstream compatible and we can pull in um, any updates that might happen. Um, it all, we also try to uh, merge back everything that is generally useful. So um, I've added a couple of features, um, and yeah, that's, that's that. Um, this is what the change management looks like. Now it looks a little different than um, in the demo because the demo was recorded a few months ago. Um, but the fork part, is kind of still an, a sore spot, and with plugins, we don't need them anymore. So um, a while back, I contributed a plugin system to Netbox, and it was rejected um, because Jeremy didn't like my uh, Jeremy is the maintainer didn't like my approach, uh, and that's totally fine. Uh, and now they're trying to figure out how and if a plugin system makes sense. If you want to have something like this. Um, Scan that QR code. There's a GitHub issue there. Uh, just tell Jeremy that we need this to make this happen. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so uh, I, I, I'm going to skip. Up. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Um, <laughs> we write all of our YAML directly into GitLab, and uh, we also use it for all of our other code. So our Netbox fork is also in there, and so on. Um, it's a whole lot of YAML in our network productions. Uh, uh, it's about 500,000 lines of YAML. Um, it's gonna be well over a million by the time we've put everything in there. Um, but that's not something that GitLab can't handle. It's totally fine. Um, that's what divs look like. So even though you have 500,000 lines of diff, um, in the end, you only see what has changed. So this is, this is kind of nice. Git is great that way. Uh, we use issues and merge requests for features. And uh, as you saw, all of our changes are merge requests. Um, we just use that out of the box uh, through the API. Pretty good. Um, we approve, we uh, enforce approvals on our network production so that uh, someone from the network team has to approve everything before it goes through. Um, that's a paid feature, um, so you need at least bronze for, for that. Um, we also use these approvals to get uh, uh, information back from the ticket system that uh, our business people use, so we have a separate system for that. So once the ticket was approved there by business and they say it's okay, customers are not affected, or if they are, it's fine, then an approval is added to the technical part. Um, we use labels, so that makes it just easier to filter through things. Um, a bunch of them are automatically generated. It's just, it's easy that way. Um, our 
infrastructure is run through GitLab CI CD pipeline. It uses the GitLab runner. Um, everything that verifies, that provisions, changes, all of that runs through a pipeline. Um, when the merge request first gets submitted, we just check, is the syntax okay? Does this look all right? Will anything break? And then when it's merged into production, a second pipeline runs that does the same thing and then provisions everything with Ansible. Um, from a bird's eye perspective, all we do is set up a few things, um, talk to a bunch of services, and then uh, deploy things with Ansible. And that's what the check pipeline looks like. It has five stages. Um, the most important one, as you can see, is the biggest one. Um, it checks everything, the zero-touch provisioning, uh, our cumulus, our Cisco roles, everything. Um, and we didn't have to add anything to GitLab, so no software added. Uh, all, we did, uh, all we had to do was define the steps uh, that we need in our CI definition. And that's the actual provisioning. It's the same thing, except there is uh, another set of jobs in the production run. Um, there are two roles in there that need manual acknowledgement. Uh, you can see them uh, with the play button. So if you look, uh, the play button ensures that the actual provisioning only happens uh, when you say, when you again give your approval, right now is the right time. With that, we ensure that um, we keep our maintenance windows and so on, if something happens. And uh, validating cabling, as you can see up there, has failed, but it's allowed to fail, so it's fine. Something that we experimented with and uh, decided it's actually cool, but we don't, we don't care enough to maintain it. <laughs> All right. In the lab, actually. Yeah, yeah. In the lab. <laughs> um, right. Uh, apart from a few custom Python scripts in the pipeline, everything is just vanilla Ansible. Um, there's nothing magical. We describe what you would do manually. We get all of the, all of the Ansible um, feature set. Um, it's also, it, it means that it's both, both basic and understandable, but it's also super extensible. Whatever you can express in uh, Ansible, we can, we can put in the pipeline. Um, Adding new steps is as simple as adding new playbooks, so that's nice. Um, and we, can, we, we went as far as also deploying our monitoring, um, our DNS, and so on through our pipeline. It's all super simple, um, but if you take it together, then you have complete automation. It's an extremely powerful system. For this part of the pipeline, so, so we're through the pipeline now, um, through the entire change management. Um, we also have a few adjacent services. Um, we use Prometheus um, to look at our, uh, to, to, for our monitoring. We have a few custom exporters. Um, we uh, use a Cumulus exporter, which is going to be open source today. We have a, uh, contributed to L, uh, WLCOM's uh, Cisco exporter, which is great, has been working great for us. Um, we use TopDesk for our big business ticket system. There is an open source Python wrapper so that you can use the API without too much pain. Um, that took me a few days, but since then I don't have to touch anything anymore, so that's great. Um, and we built a little thing that's also open source called Mimir, which uh, proxies SSH sessions through HTTP and wraps everything in JSON. So uh, for those uh, devices that have broken SSH implementations, you might see them uh, in the wild every once in a while. Uh, we, just, we just wrap those broken SSH implementations and you can write normal HTTP calls, get the results back. And it just, it, it, it's just a huge performance, uh, not performance, but a huge productivity gain. Um, right, and that uh, uses Paramico and NetMico, and it's also on our GitLab. So, uh, yeah. in the end, <laughs> all we wanted to do is, um, we wanted to stop caring about hardware. Uh, I suck at navigating CL vendor CLIs and I don't ever want to do it, and so I write playbooks. Um, 
We wanted to make switching hardware vendors as easy as switching software stacks. So it's not totally easy. Um, some software just calcifies like the hardware, but, but it's, it's mostly simpler than the hardware side. Um, it means that we had to build a whole bunch of abstractions like Mimir to make it easy to change these bits in our pipeline. Uh, but, but this far, it's been fun, it's been relatively easy and surprisingly painless. Yeah. And um, in the end, uh, we basically have to, to say we needed flexibility. And um, we wanted to be able to represent um, our business workflow and the tooling we use. And uh, we not succeeded because of building software. I mean, you have to see, uh, we rethought the way we want to do our core business in the future, and we wanted to be like Netflix. And what we did for that, uh, we built something. I mean, right. <laughs> and the cool thing is that it's all open source. Um, we're not super at it. The Netbox fork is not open source just because it's painful, and we really want to wait for um, for uh, the plugin system so that we can put in plugins and contribute that back. Um, if you really want that stuff, just, you know, there's a QR code that was up there. It's issue number 3351. I know it by heart by now. <laughs> um, so please help us get this through. Um, but building things on top of open source means that we have all the power of the community, all the power of you, um, and I hope we're being a good partner in this. Um, if you need our software, all of it is on, most of it is on GitLab. And um, then I just have to, to make the last slide and to say uh, thank you for listening to us. Um, we're here, you can talk to us. If you want to see this, we can just have a look at our lab environment and if you uh, look at our GitLab account and you see there's something missing, then just let us know and we'll see what we can do. And um, yeah, now the question, are there any questions to us regarding that? Thank you.